Uh, <laughs> hi, my name is Jennifer Cohn. I'm a professor at Drew University, and we are going to play the health insurance game. I want to thank Alan for the extra time to play the game. Um, I also want to thank Dahlia for doing the actuarially fair premium. I had the, the pleasure of taking my graduate level health economics from Dahlia, so I think you might see some of her ideas reflected in what I do. I'm um, going to start very briefly with the problem and how the health insurance game can help us solve that problem, and then we're going to play, and then we're going to discuss what happens and how you can adapt the health insurance game for your classes. So, I mean, so much jargon, so little time, and our students have so little experience actually buying insurance, so even if we can teach them the vocabulary, they don't have the intuition. And I mean, really, who knew health insurance? <laughs> I, I mean, I know it's early in the conference, but I think we should have some sort of a drinking game or an over <laughs> as to how many times that comes up in the next few days. Um, I don't know, has anybody ever seen these great Kaiser family surveys? Has anybody used these? If you haven't, they're great. Kaiser has on their website a whole bunch of quick surveys. I get my students to take them. And this, they have one on health insurance. And the thing to note is that only 4% of the people who take this survey, and this is easy stuff, what's a deductible, what's a premium, get all 10 questions, right? So the problem is just really a low level of understanding of even the basics of insurance. And so we play the health insurance game to give students the opportunity to run around and buy and sell insurance under different policies. And so they drive home the intuition because rather, you know, they don't just sit there and listen to it, they, they live it. And this is the slide that I use in my class, and for them, you know, I'm an economist and incentives matter, so I give out bonus points like candy in my class. Um, you, I can't do that, I was gonna bring you candy, but we're health economists. And um, so I hope you just play with me for the fun. Um, there are lots of different ways to play this game. The basic recipe, you can have lots of different policies, you can have lots of different information sets, and you can play around with risk. For the game we're going to play today, we're going to start at the beginning. We're going to have free market policies, anything's going to go. We're going to have perfect information, and we're going to start off being risk neutral. Okay? And after we play our round of the game, I will talk to you about how I adjust the game to bring in different policy perspectives, to bring in different information sets, to bring in risk aversion. And again, that depends on your class. We've already talked a little bit about how wide of a di wide diversity we have among students who we teach. So this game is really adaptable as are our other two presentations. What do you need? You need risk cards. I have a set of little laminated three by five index cards with numbers on them. Since we're only playing one round, I have written your risk numbers on your cards, which I'll distribute for you later. Okay. You need a random number generator. I like to go low tech and use a six-sided die. If you are more high tech, there are all sorts of funky, I've wasted so much time on you know, looking at apps for random number generators, but I always come back to the tried and true. But if you wanna use a funky random number generator, go right ahead. Um, you need insurance company advertising. So I want to thank Elizabeth again for carrying our big paper. Uh, people need to go where to know, need to people need to know where in the room to go to buy their insurance. And I have some teams who get real excited about advertising and they draw pretty pictures and that's all fun. But we for this game are gonna have four insurance companies, one over there. One back there, two in the back. I feel like I'm on an airplane. Your exits are on the side. Yeah. In the back. Okay. And we need score sheets. So again, I have the score sheets, and the insurers who I have I've drafted before class have their score sheets. And you need something to write with. So if you're doing everything totally electronic, if you can grab a pencil, you're going to need a pencil or a pen. And the math is pretty easy. You can either do it in your head or on your cell phone. So the, the stuff you need isn't a lot. So here are the rules. Very simple. You are either a customer or you are an insurer. Both customers and insurers are simply trying to maximize the amount of money they have at the end of each round. Um, there have only been a couple of times where I've played this over a number of days with more advanced students where I get involved in saving and pools and so forth. But 
Right now, just one year, every round, maximize your money. Okay. So, customers have risk cards. Your risk card will have a number from one to six. That tells you how sick you are. You have a low number, you're not very sick. You have a high number, sorry. So if you have, I'm going to give an example in a second. At the end of each round, customers have a starting dollar amount. Okay? They either pay a premium, or if they don't buy insurance, they have to pay their expenses. So I am happy to give you all these slides. So don't worry about taking pictures of them. I'll, I'll send it all to you. Okay? Insurers, you're going to collect premiums. And then I'm going to roll the die. You're going to see how many of the people who you sold insurance to get sick. You're going to pay their expenses. And you're going to see if you have any money left at the end. Okay, so let me walk through a quick example. Okay, so let me first pass out these cards so that you can look at this. Uh, let me do, I'm going to do the example, then pass out the card. So suppose you get a number two, right? Suppose your card has a number two on it. That means you're going to get sick if I roll a one or I roll a two. So that's two out of six, that's 33%. You have a one third shot of getting sick. Let's just say the cost of getting sick is $5,000. So going back to what Dolly was doing, the actuarially fair premium, two thirds of, a, of the time you're not gonna get sick, you're not gonna pay anything. One third of the time you're gonna pay $5,000. So your actuarially fair premium, your expected expenses is $1,667. So again, if I roll a one or a two, if the customer is uninsured, they have to pay $5,000. If the customer is insured, they don't pay anything. The ins if the customer bought insurance, the insurer is gonna pay the $5,000. How does that premium? Everybody got it? Pretty simple, okay. If I roll a three, four, five, or six, the customer stays healthy. So if they paid insurance, they still have to pay their insurance premium, right? but they don't have to pay the $5,000. And the insurer pays no medical bills, they just collect the premium, okay? So you want a low number and a high roll. For anybody who ever goes to Vegas, this should be intuitive to you. <laughs> Questions? All right, so we have more people than we did when I set up my insurance company, okay? So before I go through the score sheet, where are my insurers, people who volunteered to be insurers? So I got one, two, three, four. Can you recruit like the person next to you? to be another insurer and pass them up another insurance score sheet, okay? Because I think you're gonna need, you're gonna need help over there. Otherwise, you're just gonna be mobbed with people buying insurance from you. So you can recruit somebody. I got folks in the back there and I got one more. Can you pass this down to our second insurer? Fantastic. And now, aren't you all dying to know what number you get, right? Are you healthy or are you sick? Take one and pass it around. Take one and pass it around. There you go. There you go. I was going to pass these in the beginning, and I'm glad I didn't. Take a number, pass it around. See what number you get. Oh, no! I'm a six! Now, sometimes, I didn't know how many people were coming today. When I do this in my class, I do try to have, you know, 5% high risk. I do try to spread out the numbers. Did they get all the way around? We need some more over here. There, there's plenty. Yeah, I cut up like 130. Actually, my kids cut up 130. No, no, don't sit here going, no, I didn't get a card, I can't play. There, there's some coming down. You guys have enough back there? You good, you good, everybody have one? I have two teenage children. They're very useful for class activities. Okay, so take a look. So you all have a card. You're all gonna start with $10,000. You all have a number that is pre-written in on your card. Again, when I play this, I collect the cards after each round and give people new numbers. So if you get a bad number the first round, you're not stuck with a bad number for the whole game, okay? So let's say you go buy insurance and you manage to get somebody to sell you insurance for $1,500. Do you have to wait for me to roll the die to know what your ending money is? No. Yeah. right? 
Because it doesn't matter whether you're going to get sick, you're not going to pay anything. So you can fill that right in. Okay? So if you actually buy insurance, go ahead, fill it in. Who cares what the roll of the die is? Isn't that the point of insurance? Right? And that, that drives that intuition. Right? You buy insurance, I don't have to worry about what happens. Okay? Um, the different scenarios, so suppose you buy insurance and you have a four, right? Well, that means that you're going to pay more, but you have insurance, so you still don't have to pay your expenses. So if you're sitting there with a higher number, right, think about how you feel about that. What if you don't buy insurance? Well, if you don't buy insurance, right, and it comes up a higher number than your card, well, you have no expenses. You gambled well, right? But if you didn't buy insurance and you did get sick, you have to pay the $5,000. Everybody with me? Should have covered everybody's scenario, right? So the insurers, again, we're just playing one round. You don't really have to write people's names unless you want to get in touch with them later for <laughs> reasons. Um, you just need to write down what's your premium and what their card number is, okay? And then I'm gonna roll the die, we'll play, we'll talk about it. Everybody ready? Okay, so here's how you set up the scenarios. And after we play this round, I'll show you a bunch of other scenarios that allow us to bring in other risk profiles on the policies. But right now, we're all starting with $10,000. Another thing you can do is start people with different amounts of money and talk about the income elasticity of insurance if you'd like. You have some people in the room who only have $5,000, other people in the room who might have $100,000, you can do that. Paying okay. sick expenses, we're keeping it simple. One expense, $5,000, obviously you can make that more complicated as well. Some of the things that we saw in the last presentation, you can have different illnesses, you can have different treatments for different illnesses and so forth. Okay. But now we have a free market perfect information. What does that mean? That means I've distributed your risk cards before you decide to buy insurance. You know your risk profile. And it's a free market. Insurers can ask any question and customers must answer. That means that if an insurer asks to see your number, you must tell them. It's like perfect underwriting, right? So that's what we mean by perfect information in this round. Okay? So if an insurer asks you, you must show them. The insurers, my insurer friends, thank you. You can charge any price you want. You don't have to charge the actuarially fair premium. Charge any price you want. Your goal is to beat the other insurance companies and end up with more money at the end. Okay? And you are perfectly free to charge different prices to different customers. This is a completely free market. Any questions? All right, how am I doing on time? I'm good? All right. This is, I've never played it with this large of a class. So, <laughs> My, most of my classes in true are like 25, 30 students. Um, um, but it can be done. So let's see, we have four insurance companies. You don't have to go to the one closest to you, although I assume human nature being what it was and hotel <laughs> distance law being what it is, um, that you will. Let's see if we can all decide whether to buy insurance in five minutes, then I'll roll the die. Ready, set, go. whether you stay healthy or get sick. Ready? Ready? Elizabeth, do you want to do the honors as the organizer of our session? Because then no one yells at me. Just, just toss it on the floor. It's like the Super Bowl. It's a two! Yeah! It's a two! So, if this number Lower. If you have a number that's higher than two, congratulate us. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. I do that all the time. I do think one of them. Low number and a high roll. We got a low roll, so lots of y'all got six. So sorry. Too bad, so sad. So now you get to compute how much money you have left. All right? So let me pull that scorecard back up. So the roll of the die, come on, come on. The roll of the die was a two. The roll of the die was a two. Right? So the only people who didn't get sick are who? One. The ones. Everybody else got sick. Thanks, Elizabeth. 
She had one. So it was clearly rigged. This is why I never roll the die, because I never want my students blaming me. So this way, this way, this way, this way. So what happened? What happened? What what we see? Yeah. You were right. It's like, I wasn't raising my hand. No, why not me? What you see, what you feel, what happened? Teachers are just as bad. Tell my students. Yeah. If you if you were a six, you couldn't get insurance. You could not get insurance. How many people had sixes? Raise your hands. How many of you who had sixes bought insurance? For how much? $5,000. $5,000. Right? $5,000. How many people did not buy insurance at all? What is our uninsured rate? You know, give or take, we have 100 people. I'm going to say about 20%. Just round numbers. Um, of the people who did not buy insurance, did any of you have a four? Yeah. Wow, you are a risk-loving <laughs> economist. What number? You had a four? Yeah? Anybody have a five who didn't buy insurance? No? So mo what, what numbers? Yell out some. One. One, two. Two, two, two. So what am I easily able to illustrate here? Right? What do we see in the news all the time? The young invincible. Well, congratulations, you all are, are my young invincibles who aren't participating in the market. Right? The same thing with my sixes, right? Can you buy insurance for anything less than what it's going to cost you? It's not. It's not. What else? Did anybody buy, did anybody have a low number and buy insurance for a little more than what the actuary would fair premium would have been? Anybody have a, a two and maybe spend $2,000 for insurance? No? No, no, no. Huh. Usually I get a few. And what, what that, that does, it's like, well, why'd you do that? It's like, well, I just didn't want to take the chance. Right? Did it? Did anybody think that? It's like, well, should I take the chance? Is that something that was going through your head? Okay. So when, when students do that and they end up paying a little bit more, I'm able to talk about risk, right? So we did this with risk neutral, actuarially fair premium, no risk, right? But you know, most of us are risk averse. We have a declining marginal utility for money. And so again, now I'm going to give you a bunch of extensions as to how to take this basic game and play more rounds and build in more of the intuition. So one of the first things I do is talk about risk. And again, it depends how math phobic your students are. Um, I teach intermediate micro theory, where this is part of my curriculum, so this fits in fine. Um, and I talk about a willingness to pay. And I use a basic square root utility function, which I'm sure many of you do if you do risk aversion. Right? And we calculate, this is the same numbers, $10,000, one-third probability of getting sick. What your willingness to pay would be, right? And notice that your willingness to pay if you are risk averse is higher. Recall that the actuarially fair premium was $1,667, right? And I, I link it to that gut feeling that, they, that students have when they were playing the game. Well, what's that gut uh, worth to you? <laughs> Right? Highly technical. Um, a lot of times I gotta remember, I gotta teach how to actually do the math. <laughs> it's what it is. So then another thing we can do is build in asymmetric information. So in this round of the game, I said if the insurer asked you for your card, <clears throat> excuse me, you had to tell them. And a lot of you are like, huh? Right? I'm not gonna tell them. Well, then I play another round of the game where, again, cards are distributed before. And the insurer can ask you, but you can lie. Which also allows me to talk about my favorite health. <laughs> you can lie. And we play, um, again, with the same, same game. So the only thing I've changed is now the patient has more information than the insurer. Okay? And this allows me to illustrate the death spiral. Because if you're an insurer, what are you thinking? 
right? So pretend we're playing again, insurers. What's going through your head under these rules of the game? Everybody's keeping a secret. <laughs> so, you know, when, when, when you're thinking about what you're going to charge, remember, you're in competition with the other insurers to get these two bonus points to pass my very, very hard class, right? So you don't want to just give up, right? So the insurers actuarially fair premium, their best guess, right? assuming that you have an equal distribution of risk in the population, is going to be $2,916.60. But what's going to happen to the market if all these insurers are charging $2,000? Who are the only people who are going to buy? Right? These people aren't going to buy. Right? So is this $2,900 an accurate actuarially fair premium for the pool who are actually going to buy insurance? No, right? Because they're not going to buy. And so we get into a little bit of game theory here. Well, what I think that you think that I think that you think, and I'm able to talk about game theory, which I love. Okay. So these people aren't going to buy. So now I'm left with a best guess of just a pool of these folks, and I'm going to charge $4,000. Well, who's not going to buy? Anybody with a four, so I got to take them out. Well, now this isn't my best guess anymore. Now my best guess is this. Well, if that's what I charge, who's going to buy? Okay. And voila, insurance death spiral. Okay. Only by doing that first round and only changing one little thing and letting people do what they want to do anyway, which is always a great way to play a game. Because okay. otherwise, people will just gave your system. So you get to illustrate the insurance death spiral. Um, we can also have symmetric uncertainty. So we start to talk about the policy <coughs> where insurers can't ask you anything, and really consumers don't know anything anyway, right? So to do that, I just distribute the risk cards after you buy insurance. So you now have to go buy insurance not knowing whether you're a one, two, three, four, five, or six. Now what's going through your head? How are you feeling? Right? And, and I talk a lot with my students about how do you feel? What's your gut? One of my favorite quotes when I'm teaching is all models are wrong, some are useful. Right? The models are great, but they have, to, they have to match reality to some extent. And when we're talking about models, about human behavior, they have to match how we feel. Right? So this is a, another scenario. Consumers can ask, but customers don't know anything. They can still charge any price, still charge different prices. Now we start to get into other supply side regulations with different rounds of the game. So here we have community rating and perfect information. So insurers can ask and customers must answer. So you have to show your card, but insurers have to charge the same price to everybody. Community rating, right? Community rating. And they can refuse to sell insurance the pre-existing condition exclusion. Okay. So if somebody comes and shows you a six, they can go, yeah, I'm charging $3,000, and no, I'm not selling it again. Too bad, so sad. Okay. Boom, 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 boom. We can talk about guaranteed issue. So the only thing I've now changed from the last round to this one, right? We have perfect information. I have to charge the same price to everybody and I have to take all comers, right? So I have guaranteed issue because, you know, the other, the discussion we have, the other, well, that wasn't fair. They said no to me. I don't like that. I'm like, okay, let's write another law, right? Now they have to sell to everybody. Now let's see what happens to the market, right? We could talk about the individual mandate, right? So, Insurers can ask any question. They have to charge the same price. They can't refuse to sell. And customers must either buy or pay the penalty. And one of the interesting things I've done with this round is I have made the penalty consistent with the level of penalty in the federal law, which hopefully we all know is way too low to induce anybody to do anything <coughs> relative to the cost of insurance, right? It is not going to get the young invincibles to pay 2,000 some odd dollars for insurance that's under community rating, or at least under the bands of a one to three, rather than the lousy $600 penalty. 
which is the maximum penalty. Most of our young invincibles would pay much less than that. So we can simulate the individual mandate and see what happens to the market. We can also include mandatory coverage, right? You can include preventative care coverage, and this is my last one. Okay. So we can say that insurers must cover, let's say, preventative care. Right? That costs $150. You have to cover a well visit. You have to cover the flu shot or whatever. Right? Now, how much are you willing to pay for insurance? And this allows me to talk about the elasticity of demand for insurance. Because some of the customers, right, boom, boom, you know, if, if demand is not <coughs> elastic, if there's no elastic demand, I'm sorry, if demand is elastic, meaning if customers would not do this preventative care in the absence of insurance, then they're going to compute their willingness to pay thinking, well, without insurance, I'm not buying that preventative care, right? Because it's going to cost me money. So if I don't have insurance, I'm not going to buy it, the definition of elasticity. Okay? And so then my actuarially, my willingness to pay is going to be the same as it was before, but the actuarially fair premium to the insurer is going to be higher because the insurer has to assume that if they're giving you free care, you're not going to leave money on the ground. Although we talk about that too and how many people have free mammograms and free this and free that and who still don't do it. But if insurance is inelastic, like, well, you know, people are still going to get their mammograms and their flu shots, well, then what happens? Then this is a really raw deal, right, if you are risk averse. Because then you're building in that cost to a concave utility function. And you are paying more in your willingness to pay than if you had just paid the lousy $150 for your preventative care yourself. Okay. So, yeah, so I have a lot of fun doing this. I have more fun doing this than, than lecturing. I hope you do too. I hope this has inspired you to play the insurance game. You can customize it. You can customize it for different levels of math. You can customize it for different policies that you want to focus on. You can customize it for different amounts of time that you want to spend doing it. I think I've tried to make it you know, pretty simple with the rules and the dice, and I am more than happy to share any and all of this with you. So if you just shoot me an email, I'll send you the scorecards. I'll send you my slides. I'll chat with you about logistics. Um, I'm trying to get one of my more tech-savvy students to make me an app. I was inspired by the IKEA app, right? <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool if, if the students, especially if you're teaching a very large class, might be able to just download an app, maybe with all the math pre-programmed for them, although as a, a professor, I, I cringe at some of that paper and pencil. But anyway, thank you so much for playing with me. Thank you. premium with risk aversion. Like I show them the math of how to compute the actuarially fair premium. But, actually, but then I get to discuss, well, some people, none, none in this room, but you're all economists, so I would assume that, you know, you're not my undergrad. <laughs> right, but, but I do almost always, I've always had students who have paid more than their actuarially fair premium. And that allows me to get into that discussion. Why? Why would you do that? Why would you pay more so than the actual? The and they say, and they right, and they're like, well, I just didn't want to take the chance. And I'm like, yes, exactly. And that's called risk aversion. <coughs> that, that you are willing to pay to get rid of that queasy, uncomfortable feeling. And I can actually show you how much you're willing to pay under a very simple functional form. Um, when I teach finance, I use you know the negative binomial and the quadratic and all sorts of other crazy stuff that I don't use when I yeah. So how long do you normally run your sessions like the game for? So I've done this in a lot of different contexts. In a lot, the, the youngest group I did it with was a bunch of fifth graders when my younger son was in fifth grade. Um, and I did that for about an hour, right? Um, very simple stuff. I have done it in sort of evening open sessions to the public 
over about two and a half hours, but that was with more lecture about policy, and you know, that was open to alumni, and yada, yada. When I'm teaching health economics, I usually do it over two or three days, depending upon whether I'm teaching a two-day-a-week section or a three-day-a-week section, and I'll build up the policy over several days, but that's in a class focused on health economics. When I teach it in, some, some years I do it in intermediate micro theory, um, and then I'll just do it in one day. One, uh, my, my intermediate micro section is an hour and 10 minutes. Okay. So it really can be highly <coughs> customizable. I think the instructions are pretty easy, so it doesn't take a long time to set up. Um, the hardest part logistically, as you saw me doing, is trying to figure out how many insurance companies and where to put them in the room. Yes. So perhaps for that effort it would be an idea to roll the dice individually. Ah, to roll the dice individually so everybody gets their own dice to roll. That would be great if I could do it on an app with a random number generator. That's a great idea. Um, one of the things, I don't know about your students, one of the things I have to worry about my students is cheating. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would need to trust Bob, like find some way to verify that they weren't just generating new random numbers until they got the one they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. For for this yeah. particular game, I didn't know how many people we were gonna have, so I just my kids yeah. did that. They just did one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. But when I do it, um, you know, I, I try. To, I you know, it's not exact. If I have thirty students, I'll have like one, six, two, five. Like I do try to make the skewness um, match uh, as much as I can. Yeah. It's all you know, cost benefit of the time that you want to spend <laughs> figuring all that out. Anything else? Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, it's probably a question for Dahlia as well, but um, when, when you're getting into the, when you're getting students to discuss the real issues, which, mm -hmm. is, what, which is why these games are great, because they get people to reflect on why do I want to have insurance and mm -hmm. things like that. How do you um, manage the ethical side of the discussion? I mean, do you, do you actually get them to start talking about, well, should we have insurance? Should we, should we think about health in a different way? You know, go back to science, mm -hmm. you know. That's never... Charge of an insurance system, but, you know, you're going to, you're going to you mean, should we have a private insurance? Should we have yeah. a, a government NHS system? You know, yeah. Do you get into that, in that, especially when you're doing things like you're starting to change income? And sure, is, sure. And associate you certainly could. Um, I never have, for no good reason other than I don't think it's come up. Um, and I also... You know, I also teach in a business school. Um, I do discuss it, perhaps because I first started te I first started teaching in the school of public health. Now I teach in uh, the school of public affairs, and um, yeah, I talk about the ideas of social insurance and 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 what do people want in insurance and things like that. So yeah, does it tend to take over? I'm just, I'm just I'm just thinking that you're trying to get them to think through the math and, and, and the sort of Well, structure. I teach the analytical things first. I mean, I tell them we're going to get to that, but I, I do teach it as a bunch of tools that will help us, and, and I will bring up some of the more realistic aspects as we go. But no, I mostly do that once we have the analytics frame. My suggestion, and one of the things I have done when, like, really just stuff is coming fast and furious and I want to get to the next round, is I, you know, I'll write the issues down on the board. I'm like, these are great. Let's go through the next couple of rounds and let's spend the last 10 minutes coming back to this and then we'll, you know, you just, like any other class discussion, you've got to be in the moment and, and wing it a bit. I just wanted to say that, uh, again, to the ethics point, so it's pretty implicit in these value judgments in the, in the process of, uh, you know, playing the insurance game. So, yeah, you know, you, you, for example, the value of freedom to choose, uh, notions of justice and all of these things are already implicit in, this, in the act of a society choosing to go with private insurance, for example. Um, and so it might be helpful to help the students kind of 
think about and make explicit those implicit assumptions or implicit value judgments, and, and then maybe reevaluate them. Um, values tend to be at the very, very high upstream. I, was, I, I think with this format, you can craft a scenario that matches pretty much anything. I have done it before. You know, so I remember a student uh, a couple years ago was like, well, what about single payer? I'm like, great, let's go single payer. And I got rid of all the insurance companies and we just made one, right? And I said, you're not buying insurance, you're paying taxes. How much are you willing to pay? Right? And so I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, we can think about, and I'm happy to think about how you would structure that as a round of the game. Can I add, add a comment? Yeah, I, I do that as well. I mean, I very much talk about, as an example, of, you know, government is the sole insurer. Everyone requires you that. What different tax structure do you want? What different ones can you have? Um, and so on. Um, but also, I mean, one of the themes in my class is that government insurers and private insurers you know, have the same cost and payment techniques and things like that. So I, I, I agree, but I also try and teach the sort of hard facts, analytical tools that budgets have to balance. Right, and that, that's the same point. It's like even if we have one insurer and we fund it by taxes rather than premiums, we still have the same guy and the same risk numbers and the same model. We had a time? Yeah, thank you so much.